the people of Armenia were divided. There were those who believed in the chosen king, chosen by who they could no longer remember. There were those who wished to cast out the mages and abominations who had usurped power and offer their heads up to the many invading armies to soften their rage. Many of the loyalists died following their king into battles on the southern border. Victories, but bloody ones. Few soldiers remained, and the invaders still came. The fall of Armenia was now simply a matter of time. That should be enough. 500 wagons of tribute. Thank you, Pandora, for sending those fragile southerners to me. Much easier to kill than those Greeks. But of course you know all about that already. My work here is done at last. Armenia has done its duty to its king and to all the world, in fact. This is the last I will see of this land before it is saved. When all are immortal in our paradise realm, I shall return to my people not only as king, not only as this scion of Pandora, but as the man-god of all, the savior of humanity. I will kill any messengers who speak to me of mortal matters from now on. I must focus entirely on building my new followers inside the Temple of Bones, and with them perform the summoning ritual. We must have enough spines, we must. Let the world fall and then be risen by my hands, higher, greater than ever before. How else could the Lady of Chaos see her plan fulfilled? <laughs> Hello there and welcome to the final episode of Wings of Eden. We begin with some bad news, I was pretty annoyed by this. No unit card passed away of natural causes and just after a couple of battle opportunities that I didn't take could have given him a last hurrah but unfortunately he didn't get one. At least he died in peace, maybe that's what he deserved after his long anonymous life. As for our other armies, we're now turtling up, just going to put the armies in our cities as our nation crumbles. But interestingly, doing this reduces our expenses so much that we can actually get rid of our bankruptcy situation. We can start making money again, which will stop us suffering attrition and allow us to hold out much longer. Not that that's going to be particularly useful in the face of the vast number of enemies that are currently coming at us. In the top left corner of our empire, there's an attack at Cotes, which has been a long time coming. This siege has been going on for absolutely ages. Consider defending it because we do have some troops, but the walls will all be collapsed, so there's not much uh, exploitation potential there. Might as well just let the enemy have their win, and in they go. Or well, actually, in this case, I think they created a vassal state or a liberated state. Either way, we lose the territory, but that turns out to not be so bad because that territory was clearly a money and food gain. By the next turn, the economy is looking good even in winter. That means we are stable. We can hold out like this if the enemy stop attacking us and Armenia actually still has all of its core provinces. We still haven't really been terribly violated by the enemy's invasions. But things are getting closer. We've got loads of armies currently besieging Artabanus inside Amida. He's got a decent garrison there, however the enemy aren't going to be terribly interested in attacking as it turns out. They can just sit there and siege us out and that's fine by them, probably the right decision. There was another siege going on up north and for this I decided to send the remnants of the anonymous army to go and support. Because by the looks of things that army isn't very good, next turn we could be able to push them away. As things turned out though, that's not going to be possible because they reinforced. Still could be plausible that we could beat whatever those armies are because we'll have the garrison involved as well. So maybe we'll have something half resembling half of an army if we put all of our men together. But I decided not to bother trying in this case. In fact, what I ended up doing was setting my men up in ambush stance. I thought possibly that other army wants to walk past or maybe we can tempt the enemy into attacking the walls because it will look like we're locally weak and the AI might feel like going for the old siege assault. They end up 
just attacking me. Clearly they discovered the ambush. We could run away here, but I'm in a sort of deathly mood. This campaign is ending, so I thought let's just have a last stand against these guys. The balance bar doesn't look good, and it's actually even worse than it looks when we get down there. So our men are just going to form up in this frozen forest and prepare to meet no unit card in the afterlife. For the last time, you are to retreat at once. Why is no one listening to me? No unit card, the hero they never knew. No unit card, the man whose heart was true. Why are you singing again? I don't. Why can't you just be normal troops? He rises up into the sky, his name slipping from your mind. All those people will forget, I'm proud to once have known the best. Forget it. Fine. Fight if you want. You'll all die, whoever you are. No unit cut, no unit cut. Pandora sends you. Regards, and the world is tumbling to us. The end of time and all of us. So let's sing and cheer a last hurrah. A very long time after that battle, after skipping tons of turns, finally something else happened when all of the armies down south decided to attack. Artabanus, who was defending this area, has died and been replaced by a Manua Capi clone. We've still got a decent army here, but it's nothing in comparison to what the enemy are attacking with. They've got four stacks. Our guys are in many cases half dead, and they've also got no supplies. So if we fought, we'll be on very tired the whole time and just won't be able to do anything. Given that, I thought, well, let's all to resolve that. Even though I was waiting for a siege defense, it was too hard when it came up. In the auto resolve, we actually killed quite a few enemy units, so that was nice at least. Now strangely, at the start of the next turn, we got news that Artabanus is still alive in some form because there was some political going on with him. I noticed that, firstly, our popular support is strangely high. The people seem to have come back around to us. We did have zero control and pretty much zero popular support for a long time. And we spotted that Artabanus is somewhat alive. He appears to be in whiteface and has managed to marry himself into the royal family in some way. So not sure what's going on there, but I decided to make him the heir of the Chosen King, since we've now got somebody in our family tree for once, which is a very rare thing indeed. Anyway, moving on, the next thing that happened was we got attacked up north. This was another case where things are looking very bad, but I did decide to fight this one. The enemy don't have that many units, and it depends what the setup is. We may be able to resist them if they can't get into the city. The problem was, as we can see, the city was lacking part of its wall due to earlier siege works. So the enemy just dropped their siege equipment and run right at us. And that is going to be a problem because the only thing we have to block up these gaps in the wall are levy spears, and they get pretty much killed by the first unit that arrives, cavalry. But cavalry that's too good to actually get killed by the levy spears as bonus against cab so they die then some infantry start to catch up and charge in just had to have uh, skirmishers hold the line to see what happens and what happens is they rout and die instantly and that was the end of that it wasn't the end of the battle though because it uh, it seems to be the case the enemy can't find a way to get to my archers it might be there's no passable route up to them because of the wall damage so the units just stood around getting shot none of them bothered to go capture the city and win the battle that way However, after a while, my men just gave up. I guess they got tired from shooting the bows. That gave them a morale debuff, and then they routed. So the battle just suddenly ended while we were inflicting plenty of damage on the enemy. And there you go. Annoyingly, though, the enemy did not capture the city. They just sacked it. And that's annoying because I wanted them to capture this place so that they would go on to attack the capital. What I was looking for here was for enemy armies to go and attack our capital so we can have some final battles in and around it. But it still hasn't happened yet, and after like another hour of slapping end turn right here, it just never happened. So, at this point, I'm just going to say the campaign is over. It's harder to lose than I expected. Losing is very difficult. 
so we'll just have to pretend that I lost. And I'm going to use a custom battle to create a nice final engagement for us to go out on. And I'll write some sort of semi-conclusive end to this twisted tale. Just before we enjoy that, allow me to give you a quick contest. Let's play Who is the World's Oldest Man? And it's particularly interesting because there are a lot of very old men out in the world. We can see some of the ages of other existing characters via the diplomacy screen. And lots of them are effectively immortal by the looks of things. I think someone mentioned a while back that this can be caused by the entire family tree of a faction getting wiped out or something. And then the AI doesn't want to pass on rulership of a faction to someone that's not in the tree or something. And long story short, it just makes whoever the faction leader is immortal so that no more successions ever have to happen. As a result, many of the characters alive now have been alive for most of the game and are still going strong. But who is the oldest of them all? That prize goes to Balderick over here at the ripe old age of 175 and he's still looking perfectly young and healthy for it. He's been having a great life up there in Swabia. So congratulations to him. Clearly Manua Cappy's magic has gone too far. It's time for all of this to end. One by one, the Valleys of Eden fell to well-organized, well-motivated invaders. The world knew of the wealth hidden away in these Armenian cities, and no campaign was too long or too distant not to be worthwhile. The international coalition broke open the walls of the border cities. They swept through the fertile vales, along the shores of the Great Lakes, gathering not only coin but support. Many Armenians were eager to storm the cities themselves and see the brutal rule of the chosen king ended. So it was that a great host encamped in sight of Armavir, the king's seat of power. There were nearly as many furious Armenians as there were excited Ionians, Celts and adventurers from all corners. But the strong city walls would pay no heed to their emotions, nor would the men inside. This last Armenian army was packed with the chosen king's most loyal subjects, who had flocked to the capital over the previous few years to be close to their purported saviour in this dark time. This saviour was nowhere to be seen. Halditta, the chosen king at that time, had retreated through the tunnels inside the royal palace, deep into a network of underground caves and rivers. There, in flickering torchlight, he sat, in the inner sanctum of a most curious construction, the Temple of Bones. The vertebrae around him hummed with energy as the king recited ancient magic from a mysterious stolen tome. He could tell something was happening, for even this deep underground, the stamping of the invaders rattled the temple's columns. He couldn't hear the tunnel being dug under the city wall, but when the undermining collapsed part of the wall, there was no denying that the final days were upon his city. Stealing himself, he channeled all of his might into his incantations and called upon Pandora to end the curse of mortality that very day. On the surface, the collapse of the wall prompted a great cheer from the invading army, and the steady trundle of their advancing ladders and towers began. Armenian troops rushed to plug the breach in the wall with makeshift defences and a brigade of heavily armed men while the light troops took up their positions on the walls and towers flanking the gap. The walls were already lined with jars of pitch, in which bundles of arrows had been soaking for days. The soldiers lit the tips, then fired them out at the approaching siege engines. The pitch-soaked shafts then burned brightly like torches, setting all of the ladders and one of the siege towers completely ablaze before they could reach the walls. But with the short range of the heavy arrows, and the vast size of the towers, it was impossible to stop the other four. Troops were deposited onto the packed wall tops, and there a fierce melee broke out. There was no room to escape for either side, or even to move at all, and so it was a fight to the death for all involved. The Greek and rebel Armenian troops were relying on the rest of the army to enter the city through the breach and slaughter the defenders from behind. However, this attack had been delayed by some kind of official meeting called by a general from Pergamon, 
with most of the army fussing over some matter being discussed at the gates of their camp. Thus, the battle on the walls simply ground on, with no clear winner in sight, and with one of the towers even collapsing when a soldier threw one of the remaining jars of pitch into the open top story. Seeing that something had to be done, a group of Galatian troops ignored the calls to attend to matters in the camp, and clambered over the collapsed section of the wall. Beyond it they saw a challenging gauntlet of fences, stakes, rocks, and troops protected from chin to shin by huge shields. Looking over their shoulders at the still distant main force, and listening to the din of battle on the walls above them, they eventually resolved to smash their way into the city and take it for themselves. They began battering the inner fence, beyond which there were plenty of routes to bypass the slow defending troops and run riot through the undefended city behind them. But then, from amid the Armenian shield wall came a man who appeared to be the chosen king, until his voice rang out with a strange, unnatural tone. The man said a prayer, asking for protection from Pandora, recited with absolutely no commitment or sincerity whatsoever. Just as the Galatians cheered at this pitiful sight, there was a flash of violet light. Suddenly flames began to rise from the ground around them, like the stones themselves were burning from the inside. The fire seemed to spread along the line of the collapsed wall, creating an unbearable heat that claimed a few Galatian lives and drove the rest back outside the city for some reprieve. The fire burned and burned and burned, and never did the waiting Galatians see any sign that it would burn down and allow them back inside. In fact, it only intensified, and the heat of it began to soften even the stones of the adjacent tower base. The foundations eventually slipped, sending the top levels of the tower collapsing on the combatants on the wall beside it, killing many on both sides. The siege camp seemed to spring to life when this collapse occurred. The Galatians eagerly awaited reinforcement, but the men running out of the camp gates seemed to lack some of their equipment and were completely out of formation. More importantly, they were running around the circumference of the walls, never coming close enough to threaten them. This was the Siege of Armavir Distance Running Cup, the sort of event that was considered extremely important in Pergamon's military culture. Thousands of men participated in the race, demonstrating their strength and athleticism and performing feats admired by the Greeks and Armenians alike. By day's end, the prizes were being handed out to the foremost runners, the parties attacking the walls had died or surrendered, and the coming of night made any further use of siege engines impossible. One night was more than enough time for the defenders to fortify the breach in the wall with heavy rubble and burn the remaining siege towers. The city was surely saved. However, Pandora was not a deity that enjoyed stalemate. Perhaps as the price for her intervention in the battle, she gave a long stretch of the wall on the other side of the city a little nudge. Bricks seemed to fall away one by one, as if pulled by invisible strings with impossible strength. Once enough were gone, the wall crumbled, more completely and along a stretch twice as long as before. Both sides were as startled as each other to learn of this freak event, but the attackers wasted no time in distance running right around to the breach and entering the city. They found more pitch arrows raining from the walls and more shield walls blocking off the streets, but it was nothing compared to the defences mounted during the day. Thousands of men crowded up, eager to be among the first to loot the legendary City of Gold. They advanced with such speed that the southern gates were not closed in time, and men poured down the main street, checked only by hastily assembled, severely outnumbered Armenian troops. On the worse-for-wear walls either side of the breach, the defending archers faced a barrage of arrows and javelins from the attackers below. The famed Cretan archers picked off Armenians hiding among the battlements, and the survivors, with their escape cut off by the attackers, could only cower and pray. While those prayers made their way up to the heavens, the invaders barged their way through the shield walls in the streets and began to claim the city. Everywhere buildings were broken into and civilians killed, with the only mercy being that the usual burning of buildings was not done on account of the search for hidden gold having barely begun. 
the more savvy of the raiders left the main districts alone and rushed for the royal palace. It was lit up by huge braziers that always burned throughout the night, giving it the warm yellowish glow that had led many to claim it was made entirely of gold. This was nonsense, only the floors were made of gold, albeit only because the original all-gold palace had bent under its own weight and been replaced many decades earlier. The gates of the palace complex were open and unguarded, and so troops rushed onto the main avenue leading towards the mighty main doors. But they had gone only a few paces before those at the front ground to a halt. Ahead of them, flanking the avenue, were lines and lines of identical men, all sharing the likeness of the chosen king. There were more of them standing up to make themselves visible on the roof, more spilling from the main doors, and even the trees and bushes of the gardens adjoining the road seemed to produce more clones as easily as shedding leaves. Please submit your spines to Pandora, the clones demanded in unison. No one dared reply. More and more troops were arriving, and were clamouring outside the palace walls trying to find out what was going on. The clones repeated their request, and began advancing closer. Some carried torches, but most were unarmed. Seeing this, the soldiers swallowed their fear and confusion, and resumed their charge. In response, the clones sprang into action. They sprinted forwards and slammed into the mass of troops, tearing shields aside with their bare hands and descending on the troops without mercy. While many clones were killed by the other soldiers, their losses seemed immaterial. Every dead clone was replaced by another, and even the most able soldiers did not have the energy to resist the animalistic onslaught for long. The melee descended into utter chaos, with men fighting or trying to flee all about and both additional clones and soldiers joining the battle continually from both sides. Suddenly a rider blasted his way through the crowds at the gate and cut a path through the melee, slashing his way this and that with a keen blade, dropping clones with every strike. Where is the chosen king? He called out as he rode down the avenue, leaving behind the melee and breaking into the open space beyond it. Even here, more clones were sprinting up to join the fight, and had to be dispatched with vicious swipes or the sheer impact force of the speeding horse. Where are you? Where is the real Chosen King? Show yourself! He called again. At that moment, someone came out of the main palace doors. He was like a pale-skinned, ill version of the clones around him. I knew you would come here, my boy, he said. Chosen King! I am here to end this madness. They call me Arsuk, the Awakened One. I may look like you, but I am not your son, and I will not see this world destroyed." The Chosen King ordered his clones to form a ring around Arsuk, and he himself entered it. I think you've done, he began, but Arsuk drew his legs up, stood in the saddle, then leapt down with his sword over his head. A mighty swing cut the Chosen King open from shoulder to hip, and crumbled him to the ground. Ah, thank you. I've been needing a replacement, a voice said. One of the clones in the ring stepped forward. I could have done it myself, but it's hard to bring yourself to do it, you know? Asiaka roared, and with a lunge and a swing, beheaded the clone. Please stop it. This time, the voice came from behind him. I won't let you destroy this world! Arsika called as he sidestepped around his horse, thrust his sword into the one that had spoke, and dragged the body to the ground with it. You don't get it, do you? You can't kill me! Despite this apparent truth, Arsika tried several more times. Eventually the clones moved to restrain him, snatching away his sword and lying about his feet, gripping his legs so that he couldn't move. The current chosen king stood before him and gave him a warm smile. You are a disobedient child, but you have great passion. You will bring joy to many in the new world, he said. Just get on with it. If you knew I was here, why did you come up to see me? I won't rest until you are dead, Asiaka spat. I'm not up here to see you, silly boy. I'm here to witness the salvation. With this, the Chosen King pointed upward. The sky seemed to be slightly tinged with a violet light, the effect growing stronger and stronger. You! You summoned her! Yes, 
She told me that tonight is the night. I'm so excited. You fool! Without the second box, she will be out of control! She will destroy the world! Wherever did you get a stupid notion like that? The Chosen King asked, leaning closer to Asuka. Pandora will save us from mortality, as she has done for me already. We have paid the tribute in gold and spines. Look, it's starting! The sky was becoming as bright as day, and the clouds were being tossed about by maelstroms of burning energy. The fighting down the road had ceased, as all people of all the world fixed their gaze on the sky. Isn't it beautiful? The Chosen King asked. Yes, it is. That is the Lady's Light, Asuka muttered. Pandora, we are ready. Save us! The Chosen King called. There was a rumbling, a rumbling that would not cease. From the brilliant sky above, bolts of energy shot down and exploded in huge fireballs wherever they touched the ground. What is this? The King spluttered. She's going to destroy everything! I told you! Arsika shouted. The King wouldn't believe it and fell to his knees to pray. All the other clones instantly did the same. Please, Lady Pandora, what would you have me do? I will do anything! The King said. But these words were barely audible over the thunderous booms of the energy bolts, the howl of a growing wind, and the smashing of stones as the rumbling ground began to break apart the palace walls. Flashes of light began firing off all around them, and after each one, something seemed to have changed. After one flash, a man in animal skins was looking around and shouting in an ancient language. He shortly disappeared, but then there was a man in strange-looking armor, carrying a tool that cracked like firewood when he pointed it at nearby clones, who were then stricken with sudden stab wounds and knocked over. Other figures phased in and out of existence, of all races, both known and unknown to the king and Asuka, from times before and after their own. They saw, for a second, Artaxius, standing with sword in hand, glaring at the king. He was gone before he drew breath. What is happening? Asuka shouted. I see. I might have said the wrong spell, the Chosen King said. I think it might be time compression. Time compression? Is it fatal? Oh, very much so, the King nodded. In their minds, the pair could remember less and less of their past, and imagine times less and less far into the future. Is there a way to stop it? Nine. I mean, no. So what a- Look out! Asuka pushed the king over, and something slammed into the ground where he had stood, clanging like metal and bouncing back into the air. It fell twice more before grinding to a rest beside the palace doors. What was that? The king called. Asuka knelt and looked the object over. It was a cuboid of sheen metal, with various things inscribed on it in languages he didn't recognize. There was a join running right around it, like it could be opened somehow, almost as if it was... A box! What? It's a box! It's THE box! How could that be the box? The box from the end of time? The time compression! The time compression? Oh, Pandora, so this is what you wanted from me! <laughs> of course! Should I open it? Not yet, not yet, come on, carry it! With that, the Chosen King scurried through the doors into the palace. Asirka followed, clutching the warm box in his arms as they made their way through the relative quiet of the palace, elbowing away any clones that asked what they were doing. Down stairs and ladders they went, along tunnels and over bridges they went, traversing the darkness of the palace caves until finally they made it to the Temple of Bones. The bone columns rattled as the box drew closer. The king led Arsioka to the very center, where a bone altar sat as the lone fixture in a high-roofed chamber. Put it on the altar, quickly, the king said. What about the world? What will happen to it? Doesn't matter, come on! The pair stood on either side of the box and placed their hands on it. The king closed his eyes, and suddenly the whole temple seemed to do more than just rattle. It was shaking, shaking itself to pieces. What's happening? The bones of the temple broke free of their fastenings and closed in around the box. And over! The king screamed. 
there was a flash of violet light and the bones slammed together to congeal around the box, or more accurately, where the box had once been. Outside, everything was over. The infinite chaos of the Big Bang merged with the infinite nothingness of the expended universe, and in the unimaginable tangle of realities, the planet was broken from surface to core, flickering between the molten state of its origin and the scattered ruin of its end. The Chosen King and Asuka would know nothing of that. They found themselves dangling from a tall oak tree in a well-landscaped lakeside park. They were barely conscious but were startled awake by shouts from below in some unknown language. Oi! What are you doing up there? I see you up there. Poaching, is it? I thought we'd ship the last year to the bloody colonies. Redcoats already on their way, mates, so no point trying to talk your way out of this. The Chosen King and Arsika looked at each other, and at the box the latter still held in his arms. The Chosen King smiled. So thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of Wings of Eden, the series which was originally about a challenge run to see if we could win the game without conquering outside of our home region. That proved to actually be very easy and then just spiralled into some sort of crazy glitched exploit campaign which broke the game beyond all playability in many ways. So I'm glad that it's finally come to some sort of conclusion. So thank you for watching and very special thanks to all of the official 11 patrons and everyone who supported me throughout the creation of this series. The next series on this channel, if you're watching this when it comes out, will be a probably quite short series where I'm going to do a narrative of the main story of the city building game Frostpunk, so look out for that in the near future. And then after that I'm going to try and move on to Three Kingdoms Total War. If it's come out by that time etc, we shall see. So thanks again for watching, hail Pandora! and have a good one.